Ryan, uh, Dan uh, Demelsta, Firewolf, Maggie, uh, Kari, Fan Shen, and Lida, of course, uh, for um, calling uh, folks together tonight uh, in support of the struggle we have here in Northern Arizona. So um, I'm going to give you a bit of a background tonight, but also uh, talk a little bit more intimately about what uh, this what it means to me personally, uh, and hopefully have some time to give some uh, suggestions for folks who are looking at uh, allyship or solidarity and support work for indigenous liberation and resistance struggles. Um, so a, a little bit about who I am and where I come from. My father is a Hatafli. Uh, his name is Jones Benali. He's a medicine practitioner who's been working for more than 15 years in the Winslow Indian Health Service Clinic here in Arizona, treating patients traditionally. Uh, and so myself, my brother and sister have grown up uh, with that cultural understanding and apprenticing from him. Um, also, uh, many of my relatives have been impacted by first relocation in the so-called Navajo and Hopi land conflict uh, that really is a, a geopolitical land grab for resources in this region. And so, you know, many of my elders, like Roberta Blacko, Catherine Smith, and so forth, have really inspired me and encouraged me to step up and, and take a stand. So this is sort of the spirit of, that I, I come to you tonight uh, presenting. And, and there, there may be some folks in the room that I've worked with before, uh, but it's hard to, to see what's going on based upon the Skype interaction. Um, so for more than 40 years, uh, community members, environmentalists, and indigenous peoples have worked together to protect the coast, the, the Holy San Francisco peaks from desecration. That meaningful work has been expressed through creative and diverse strategies and actions, uh, prayer gatherings, marches, legal battles, listening sessions, lobbying, petitioning, United Nations petitions, direct actions, and more. Uh, but tonight, as I speak to you, ski area workers sanctioned by the U.S. Forest Service spray up to 1.5 million gallons of treated sewage effluent on this sacred place. The multi-million air owners of Arizona's Snowball Ski Area, including some who live in Morristown, New Jersey, which I believe is near y'all, uh, have their snowmaking machine guns aimed at this mountain, which is held holy by more than 13 indigenous nations. Since May 2011, Snowball has clear-cut 74 acres amounting to approximately 30,000 trees. The aspen, spruce, ponderosa, pine, many of that were saplings before Spanish settlers invaded this area are now fallen by Arizona snowboard employees uh, laying siege to this rare and sacred alpine forest. Snowboard is now the only ski area in the world to use 100% treated sewage effluent to make fake snow. There have been nearly 40 arrests and direct actions to protect the peaks since they started development and desecrating this mountain. More recently, four people, including myself, faced federal charges resulting from a protest in September of last year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. But first, I want to talk about uh, what is spiritual warfare and the economics of cultural genocide here in Arizona relating to this issue. Um, for Dine people, there's a dichotomy between the spirit and nature. You know, what our beliefs are is directly tied to the, our, our natural landscape. Um, and this is important to understand. And, and unfortunately, we don't have enough time tonight to talk about Dine belief systems. But um, our way of life is, is codified in a, in a physical relationship with Tzitzit or mountain soil bundles that make a, a, a physical connection to uh, not only the San Francisco peaks or the coral suite here, but uh, to all six sacred mountains that we hold as, as holy for Diné people. Um, but no words can console the people when the foundation of their belief system, the living basis of who we are in creation, is profaned. We have been railroaded by dominant culture history many times. This is, a his, this is the story of colonization, this time though not with blood, but etched into the core of our very beings. What is holy shall be violated. This is part of the essence of manifest destiny. For Mother Earth, from Mother Earth to our bodies, nothing is sacred. Our hearts, our spirits, our minds carry these wounds on top of centuries of scars. This is spiritual invasion and occupation. We did not initiate this war, though. 
This struggle did not begin with this battle, nor will it end with it. In 2004, after a half-hearted environmental impact statement process, Nora Rajer, then Coquino Forest Supervisor, approved the ski area expansion while admitting adverse cultural impacts that were irreversible and irretrievable and would, quote, contaminate the spiritual entirety of the San Francisco peaks. She spoke at a meeting of elders, medicine people, political leaders, and um, members, representatives of 13 indigenous nations that were gathered at a tribal summit that I helped to coordinate um, back then and stated, but you have to remember, I also have to protect the rights of skiers. The environmental impact statement generated under her regime had stated, snow making and expansion of facilities, especially the use of reclaimed water, would contaminate the natural resources needed to perform the required ceremonies that have been and continue to be the basis for the cultural identity of many of these tribes, end quote. Daniel Peaches, uh, who is a member of the Dine Medicine Men's Association, stated, once the tranquility and serenity of the mountain is disturbed, the harmony that allows for life to exist is disrupted. The weather will misbehave, the ground will shift and tremble, the land will no longer be hospitable to life, the natural pattern of life will become erratic, and the behaviors of animals and people will become unpredictable. Violence will become the norm and agitation will rule, so peaceful and peacefulness will no longer be possible. The plants will not produce berries and droughts will be so severe as to threaten all existence. Joe Shirley, a former president of the Navajo Nation, declared snowball expansion a threat of cultural genocide. The city of Flagstaff and the Chamber of Commerce here were delighted at Rajar's ill-informed and apparently gratuitous decision. They saw dollars pouring into Flagstaff from dirty snow. In their minds, the marginal seasonal economic gain from a single for-profit private business outweighs the interests of 13 indigenous nations and the eco ecological integrity of the mountain. Although indigenous peoples contribute to the economy and indigenous cultures are a significant draw for tourists from throughout the world, those realities are ignored. Of course, part of the message in the dominant culture is that so long as indigenous cultures are safely on a shelf, in a book, in a museum, or in the form of entertainment, they are valid, accepted, and celebrated. This dynamic can only exist at the nexus of racism and capitalism. This is not surprising in Arizona, a state that many of you know legisl legislatively suppresses cultural education and promotes racial profiling. Racism is, and ha racism has been, and still is, the geopolitics of Arizona. Racism and greed are effective binders against reality. According to the Forest Service's own report, quote, it is unrealis unrealistic to think that snowball would be a significant driver of tourism activity or the economy. Yet Arizona Snowball continues to mislead the community of Flagstaff by overstating their financial contributions to the economy by 130 percent, mm -hmm. and that, that's according to a report that was um, done by the Hopi tribe. Subsequent to the Forest Service decision, indigenous nations and environmental groups filed lawsuits addressing religious freedom and environmental violations, and ultimately the courts decided that, quote, the only effect of proposed upgrades is on the plaintiff's subjective, emotional, religious experience. So I'm going to say that again, just so you, you hear that. This is a, a ruling from the Ninth Circuit Unbound Court, is, is that the only effect of proposed upgrades is on the plaintiff's subjective, emotional, religious experience. That is, the presence of recycled water on the peaks is offensive to the plaintiff's religious sensibilities. The dis diminishment of spiritual fulfillment, seriously though it may be, is not a substantial burden on the free exercise of religion. The court dismissed our religious beliefs, referring to them as damaged spiritual feelings. So it's important to recognize that that's the context that we're dealing with in, in, in this issue, in this struggle, uh, particularly in these colonial courts. In this case, the courts made up of all native uh, or all, all non-natives affirmed their anti-indigenous bias and concluded that our deeply held uh, beliefs are merely emotionally, uh, merely an emotionally subjective experience. It's ironic 
that during large parts of the peak struggle, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which heads the U.S. Forest Service, initiated listening sessions in 2010 to address policy issues with sacred places. And on the same day that Secretary of uh, Se Secretary Tom Bilsack of the U.S. Department of Agriculture issued the final report on sacred sites uh, and an interagency memorandum to work towards sacred sites protection, and this included the Department of Interior, Department of Defense, um, and uh, on down the line, uh, the the Coconino National Forest Service filed a federal complaint with charges against myself and three other sacred sites ag ag advocates who were part of a protest uh, at the Forest Service offices three months earlier. And this is really a political attack uh, intended to intimidate and deter further protests against Snowball. The prosecutor, uh, while we're in federal court, and I have to you know, just let you know that the, the warrants and the summons uh, for these charges were sealed. We didn't find out about these charges uh, uh, except for a uh, local journalist was tipped off that there were charges being filed against us, so we found out about it, and we found out that the, the, um, the federal marshals were actually planning a raid uh, on us to arrest us in our workplaces and our homes. Uh, but we found out about this, so we ultimately we, we turned ourselves over. We just went in and we, we said, we're going to do this on our, our terms, and we turned ourselves over. And we were, we were held for up to five hours in shackles um, on our feet, our legs, uh, shackles on our uh, chains around our wet waist and handcuffed uh, to those chains for five hours in the cells. Um, and we appeared before a judge that way. And the prosecutor uh, attempted to ban us from uh, going to the peaks as a condition of release. He said he would only agree to us being released and not further held um, if uh, that was part of the conditions. Um, and so I was able to argue with my lawyer who was there that um, that would violate my religious practice, especially uh, the issue of access, that I need to access uh, the peaks um, and so forth. And so he, he the, the judge in this case, um, allowed me um, to go forward without having uh, that con as a condition really. But two of the other members uh, um, uh, of the Protect the Peaks work uh, were banned from going to Snowball specifically. Um, as I said, they're, they're banned from going up to Snowball area uh, until our trial, which is going to be in May uh, 21st. Um, so that's coming up. Um, and this is evidence of criminalization of dissent. Um, and it's clear, it has been clear. There was a, a peaks benefit, similar to the benefit you're having tonight, that was organized in Phoenix, uh, in Tempe, uh, and that was shut down by Homeland Security uh, from the state of Arizona. Uh, the Homeland Security agent went into uh, the venue where the event was going to be held and threatened uh, to shut down the whole venue if they didn't, uh, um, if, if they didn't agree to, to, to stop the, the event from going forward. Um, six people were arrested at a Protect the Peaks march in August 2011, uh, including myself, um, and we were attacked on the sidewalk. Uh, we were marching peaceably on the sidewalk, and we were attacked by um, an overwhelming force of law enforcement agents um, and you know, charged with obstructing a public thoroughfare, and those charges ultimately were dismissed. But, you know, the... the, the Criminalization of dissent continues, not just with these examples, but um, there are dozens and dozens of uh, Forest Service citations that were issued for folks in, in different actions um, for just being up on the peaks or being at prayer gatherings. Um, and so from my perspective, this is uh, an extension of the Green Scare, if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Um, and when we're looking back again at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, the final policy report, um, what possible meaning do these statements uh, have um, while the USDA continues to authorize aggressive desecration of sacred places? Uh, this struggle to protect sacred places has become contentious enough that in 2011, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recommended that uh, the United States government engage in a comprehensive review of its rele relevant policies and actions um, and ensure uh, that they are in compliance with international standards in relation to the San Francisco peaks and other sites. Um, and they urged uh, uh, the United States uh, to take, or the United Nations to take appropriate remedial actions. Um, in a recent New York Times article, Forest Service 
Uh, Regional Forest Supervisor Corbin Newman stated in defense of Snowbird, quote, snowmaking has become unnecessary because of climate change. I don't know if anybody else finds that troubling, but the logical conclusion of that argument is, is that Snowbird would ultimately cease to exist due to global warming. Uh, the USDA clearly is not thinking this issue through and appears to be confused on its priorities or perhaps under undisclosed influences other than cultural blindness. blindness. And, and, and just a statement there is, is that global warming is just a symptom of how we're out of balance with Mother Nature. And that's something that when we look at these sacred sites, we have that connection and we maintain that connection too. And that's you know, the symptom of our imbalance with Mother Nature is, is that all of these, these, these disharmony, this disharmony is occurring. Um, and bringing it back to Flagstaff, as officials in the city of Flagstaff have stated that Flagstaff could face water shortage issues in 20 years and water scarcity issues in 50 years. So what more do we need to underscore the wisdom that water is life and we shouldn't be using it for recreation in this way? The current uprising against the Navajo Hopi Little Colorado River water rights settlement has shed light on the geopolitical power that demand Hopi grassroots activists have. The settlement is an attempt by Senators John McCain and John Kyle to wrestle the Navajo and, Navajo and Hopi nations into waiving um, our rights in perpetuity. It's hard to think that either Senator has our interests at heart, though, especially considering that McCain has authored multiple bills to expedite forced relocation of Diné families from their homes. And in 2009, McCain vowed to block uh, Obama appointees to the USDA if wastewater snowmaking at Snowball wasn't immediately approved. So, I mean, the question there is, is what, uh, how, how can Snowball have McCain in their pocket? Uh, um, what interest does McCain have in allowing this single for-profit private business uh, entity to have snowmaking on, on this sacred mountain? So we've been here before, praying, testifying, petitioning, protesting, marching, litigating, going to jail and civil disobedience, locking down, and putting our, our bodies in the way of Snowball's destructive machinery. We have not come together and not subjected ourselves to police aggression for a paycheck from a nonprofit foundation or any amount of recognition. Just as we have not prayed deeply uh, just for this one sacred place, but all sacred places. Our highest possible reward here is harmony with our natural environment because we are of this earth. And so where there's a crisis of the environment, there is also a crisis of culture. Ours is not a struggle that we chose, but it really has chose us by the very nature of being who we are. And if we desire to continue to be in authenticity and spirit, we must continue to struggle. So Mount Graham, Woodruff Butte, South Mountain, Red Butte, the Grand Canyon Confluence, Black Mesa, Mount Taylor, Mount Nabo, Medicine Lake, Ponhe, Segura Tay, Baird Butte, the defense of lands held holy by indigenous peoples is the physio-spiritual front line in the struggle for cultural survival. The sacred is a parameter of what we protect today as activists or caregivers or, or stewards. We are faced with the desecration of social and environmental justice in our lands, history, and ways of life every day. Deep ecology can't exist without deep history, and so the presence of an anti-colonial understanding or settler consciousness must be at the intersection of analysis and action in all struggles on indigenous stolen lands. We breathe coal dust and drink from contaminated waters. Uranium tailings casually cover with asphalt scar our homelands. Hundreds of mines remain abandoned, yet new uranium mines threaten to open and transport their toxicity through our communities. Children are poisoned before birth, houses torn to their foundation because they're built by the tailings. From polluted ocean to ocean, from militarized border to border, from criminalized community to community, from sexually assaulted and incarcerated body to body, oppression devastates all of us. The structural violence of greed in a racist, neo-colonial, neoliberal state manifests themselves right here, right now. So long as Mother Earth is reduced to a commodity, it is clear that we're going to have this conflict. Because we are people of the Earth. We're stewards charged with the responsibility to care for and protect her. 
So what are we going to do about it? Well, he's been only, uh, one of my aunts, um, originally from Big Mountain, she's a resistor of first relocation, recently said, the natural laws and the indigenous people were already here in a good relationship before the coming of colonial society who draws, who draws law and boundaries. However, indigenous people will always have ties with these lands. We will continue to live that way with nature and we will, con we will carry on. These man-made laws by the U.S. government will vanish soon. Our requests have been humble from the beginning. Respect, religious freedom, healthy communities, and ecological integrity. At every turn, these requests have been denied. So what choices are left for us? What future is there for our ways of being? What are we willing to sacrifice to defend those ways? This battle is not lost for us here. For this struggle has always been more than just about the desecration of one holy place. This struggle is as deep as our will to carry our cultures forward for future generations. Our momentum is carried by the understanding of our relationship to sacredness. What more sacred duty could we bear than that which presents a just and free future? We, not politicians or judges, and certainly not a system built on and still profiteering on slavery and genocide, are ultimately the power that will stop snowball and the many snowballs that are out there. To abandon this journey, that which has become our struggle, is to abandon existence. So I want to talk a little bit about support and allyship here as well, because I think it's an important uh, underlying um, aspect to what we're doing and something that we've learned a lot here um, in the struggle to protect the San Francisco peaks. And one of the, the main issues that we see everywhere is invisibilization, the invisibilization of uh, indigenous communities. Um, I know there are many examples, particularly um, in, in the New York area, the area known as New York, um, and I know that Occupy Wall Street has even you know, brought up some of those discussions with decolonization you know, uh, groups starting and so forth, or an Occupy group starting. Um, but you know the fact that people still don't under make that connection to understand what Wall Street, what the history of Wall Street, what what the, even that name Wall Street, you know, as a, a wall of apartheid has meant. And so invisibilization. You know, one example that I like to share is, is that the Bay Area here in, in, in the, the so-called U.S. is one of the most looked at as one of the most progressive communities or liberal communities and even radical communities. But the Bay Area is occupied territory of the Ohlone people. There are over 300, or 300 uh, shell mounds, sacred burial sites uh, for the Ohlone people. And uh, many times the Ohlone people, their voice goes unheard. And they're completely invisibilized by the state because they're not federally recognized as a, a, as a, as a tribe. Um, but they're also invisibilized by uh, activist groups, and environmental and social justice groups, and their struggle largely goes unheard. Um, today, they've been able to begin the repatriation of more than 14,000 of human remains from uh, shell mounds that have been desecrated by development in the San Francisco area. But they've struggled for years without meaningful support from people who you would expect to you know, be natural allies in those areas. Um, so I would, I, I would argue that it's critical for anyone who desires to take down this heteropatriarchal capitalist system to articulate your location in indigenous liberation struggles. I also argue that it's really more important to support local indigenous struggles and autonomy than anything. Um, so in, even in, in the, the, the context of this discussion tonight, even though it, we're, we're, we're coming together to support the sacred site struggle uh, and, and protect the San Francisco peaks, um, I still argue that it's more important to, to make those meaningful connections to indigenous peoples whose land you're on and support those struggles because those are interconnected with those struggles that we have here. So if you, if you support the fight to protect um, the ways of life for indigenous people there, you're, you're also working to protect you know, the other indigenous communities um, throughout occupied Turtle Islands. Um, it, it, it may sound strange for me to say that, but it, 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 it's the way that these sacred places are connected and our communities are also connected. 
Um, and so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what does meaningful support look like? And for some people, it may seem obvious, but apparently it's not because we always have these problems. We, we, we continue to be invisibilized or we continue to be romanticized. Uh, we continue to face you know, situations where there's the white saviors type of complex. Or, or you know, the, the main thing is, is that in order for meaningful support to happen, we need to have communication. And a lot of times, even though it seems obvious, that's the first step that people miss. There's no communication. Um, and that's one thing that I want to address in the sense of allyship is, is that particularly with the work that we do around here, there seems to be a lot of fetishization of allyship. And what I mean by that is that people overfocus on being allies, um, but they forget that allies aren't self-appointed. They are, they are found to be. Um, and in this case, we assert that we don't need allies. We need accomplices. We need people that are going to be there with us in the trenches, in the front lines. Um, and we need to know who really has our back. Alliances are because uh, thank you. And alliances are typically more political than tactical or strategic in some ways. And indigenous struggles uh, seem to be only recognized when something interesting is happening, or there is something politically to be gained by this relationship. And I state that out of experience because. Um, for the past decade that I've been involved in the struggle to stop Snowball from desecrating the sacred mountain, I've written many articles, I've organized many, many protests, and at times, you know, I've gone to radical publications or progressive publications, um, and they refuse to print articles because nothing interesting is happening, and that's, you know, verbatim what they've said. Uh, and I argue to this day that it's easier for us in the peak struggle to get uh, corporate media coverage than to get, into, uh, not independent, but uh, uh, progressive or liberal media coverage. Uh, and we have articles coming out in the New York Times. We've had you know, uh, many articles in the Washington Post and, and you know, national news stories. But you know, it's hard for us to get our issue covered by um, progressive or, or liberal sources. And that's a challenge that needs to be addressed. Um, and so part of that for me is, is that um, we need to cultivate, cultivate, or we need, you know, those the folks who are looking at becoming allies or offering support to cultivate a settler consciousness and address settler privilege uh, in the same way other types of privileges are, are addressed as well. Um, you know, and part of that is recognizing that oppression doesn't happen by accident, and we must focus it on the eliminating of the root causes of our oppression. Um, you know, being ally doesn't negate your privilege automatically, and so we need to look at um, challenging ourselves on that on that level and looking at what privilege means in an anti-colonial struggle, and that's settler privilege. Um, I also want to talk about solidarity here, and I truly believe that solidarity is best learned through action, and I, I think that that's the only way you can actually um, learn what solidarity is, is through action. Um, and for me, I... I Go back to a quote that Bell Hooks has that I think really sums it up the best, and that's solidarity is not the same as support. To experience solidarity, we must have a community of interests, shared beliefs, and goals around which to unite, to build sisterhood. Support can be occasional. It can be given and just as easily withdrawn. Solidarity requires sustained, ongoing commitment. And that's what, that's what we need today is, is a deeper commitment um, that establishes that we have each other's backs, and we know who will have our, our backs. Um, and so uh, I know I'm, I'm running short on time here. I know we wanted to try to um, leave uh, opportunity for some questions. Um, but, uh, you know, just one thing that I want to say is, is that um, we must collectively face and confront the hard reality of oppression and environmental destruction. We must cultivate our emotional and spiritual capacity to wage a resistance struggle for liberation. Because if we don't, who will? So we have to fight back. Industrial civilization, capitalism is killing the planet, and humanity is fetishizing the murder. A living, sustainable, healthy planet and existence is possible. But what are we going to do to get there? And so that really the question that you know I have. For you, as we, we engage in a, a q and A, is what are we willing to do to get there? Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. I know it's sometimes hard to, to feel more 
a personal connection to just a screen with uh, image and audio transmitted thousands of miles. So I appreciate your patience and willingness to accept this virtual presentation while we're talking about such deep, um, deep issues. So if, you had, and, uh, if we have time for questions, um, hopefully we can do that. And I know there's lots of good food and, and other things and discussion to enjoy as well. So thank you.